Good morning. Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar, economic webinar. So I'm really happy having you with us, that you dedicate this time being with us and to have the opportunity to uh, listen a little bit more about the economical situation. As usual, uh, we will uh, present a few information. Uh, let's, let's say this way, we will do the journey around the globe with the special focus on the, the biggest uh, markets and of course, uh, focusing on our region. So um, you, you already know very well our chief economist, uh, Grzegorz Sielewicz, who will do the presentation. And uh, once again, I would like to thank you very much for the dedication uh, of your time for this, uh, for this session. Uh, hopefully uh, you will enjoy the meeting and I will give. I would like to give the floor to to Grzegorz. Grzegorz, you are you are on. Thank you, Eric. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to our webinar. We are really happy that you decided to dedicate uh, this morning, this one hour for our webinar. Uh, we hope you will find it interesting. Uh, as as always, we have a presentation for you. Uh, and uh, well, just starting from uh, technical issues. Um, well. Uh, uh, we will start with this presentation. So the presentation will roughly, I think, take uh, something like 40, 45 minutes. Uh, but then we will dedicate uh, some time also for questions that you might have. Uh, and um, if uh, you would like to ask any questions during the meeting, um, please do not hesitate to do it during, uh, during my presentation. Uh, indeed, uh, there's uh, such an option. Uh, if you open the, um, this GoToWebinar tool panel, so, so the, the tool that we use today, uh, on the right-hand side, uh, you have uh, the questions window. And if you have any questions uh, during the presentation, please do not hesitate to ask it. Uh, also, we will use this option afterwards, so uh, at the final part of our meeting uh, today. Uh, well, what else? Uh, of course, uh, we, we, if you would like to, to get a copy of the presentation we, we are going to show you today, it's available for you. You can have it actually already now at your desk. Uh, it's uh, in the hands out section. Uh, so again, on this, in this go to webinar tool panel on the right hand uh, side, you have uh, the hands out section and uh, you can uh, immediately download it uh, to, to your files, to, to your desk. Of course, we will be sending um, uh, not only the email with the presentation, but also with this video afterwards. So if you prefer that, just wait for an email uh, for us. Uh, well, OK, so I think that's all from, let's say, uh, housekeeping issues. Uh, let's start the presentation. Uh, as you can see, uh, we put a title, uh, not only that it will be the economic outlook, because it will be the economic outlook, but that the European economy is back on track. Uh, well, uh, indeed, I think it's quite crucial for us uh, to focus, you know, of course, on Central and Eastern Europe, so countries we are, um, you are from, we are from, um, but also on Western Europe, which is um, very important export destination for us. Uh, we, we depend not only on trade links, but uh, but also on, on business links, on, on various other issues. We are um, quite correlated to the situation, to the economic situation that is in Western Europe. But it won't be only uh, on Europe. Uh, we will, of course, speak about uh, the global situation because I think it's very crucial uh, for us in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, sea countries are open economies, uh, so uh, it's it's worth also to to talk about um, different economies, those those big ones that shape um, the current situation of uh, the global economy. Uh, well, let me start from um, trends that we have right now, uh, um, and as a reminder. Uh, as you know, as, as you know, we started uh, the recovery process already last year in terms of some contributors, in terms of some indicators, and one of such an indicator that started to improve quite fast um, after the first wave of the pandemic, uh, there were exports, global exports. As you can see on the chart on the left-hand side, global exports uh, volume index, uh, it's a kind of V recovery that, that we have uh, that we had here 
that we hope also that other parts of economy, other indicators uh, will follow the same, but unfortunately they didn't. Uh, but how, how did it start? Well, actually it started uh, in, in China because uh, as you remember, China was the first economy to suffer from uh, the COVID-19. Uh, at that time, not pandemic, but uh, the epidemic, that was the beginning of 2020. Uh, and uh, at the time when uh, it became the pandemic and uh, it affected markets uh, in Europe, in the US, all over the world, China was the first one to, to recover. Uh, and it also triggered to increase global demand uh, for various goods, for, for services. As a result, and thanks to that, uh, global exports improved. And as you can see uh, right now, despite this contraction that we had um, at the beginning of 2020, we are in a positive trend. Maybe this trend, this curve is not so steep like it was before the financial crisis of 2008. 2009, uh, but nevertheless, we, we are back uh, with the positive trend. Uh, and actually, that was a kind of surprise, I think, uh, because uh, not all not all companies were prepared to that. Uh, we, we were uh, we, we still tackle with, with the pandemic, but at that time, uh, we didn't know uh, what exact effects it, it will cause uh, and how long uh, it will take. Uh, and uh, as a result, some companies switched more to mode when they um, did not supply their counterparties, where there were the factories were shut uh, due to lockdowns and so on. Uh, there were many, many, many different reasons. Uh, but all in all, it all triggered an increase of various input prices. So, as you know, and as you can see on the chart on the right hand side, we have had a strong increase of commodity prices, various commodity prices. I would say a bulk of commodity prices increased. Um, uh, recently, there's a high increase of energy prices, but as you can see, when we compared uh, also other ones like metal, industrial materials, also agriculturals, uh, they are much higher than uh, they used to be, not only just before the pandemic, but also in previous years, for example, in 2017, 2018, which those years were uh, very good actually in terms of the um, economic activity. We, we, you can say that, that that was the time of, of a recovery that uh, lots of economies uh, enjoyed. Well, so that's on the commodities side, on site also on inputs. Uh, for example, very good example comes from uh, the semiconductors, chips, that there's a shortage of them uh, worldwide. Um, Semiconductors are used not only in the ICT, in uh, the electronics industry, but also in the automotive sector, in various other sectors. And the shortage of them affects um, the, the supply side and it contributes to, to supply constraints that we have uh, right now. As a result, we have supply chain disruptions. Uh, here, as you can see, just two examples, but uh, those are examples of uh, very important large economies. Uh, the US on the left hand side and uh, Germany on the right hand side. As you can see in the US, the average lead times for production materials in increased a lot according to the latest data. Uh, it's not only that it is uh, the historical high, but also as you can see the acceleration of those lead times, average lead times was very significant uh, in uh, latest months and, and actually it, uh, according to, to our estimations it will remain on uh, such uh, high levels also for, for next months. Uh, in terms of the German example, uh, as you can see in the third quarter of uh, 2021 uh, it increased but actually it already it already was high in uh, Q2 2021 uh, when, when indeed those um, supply constraints, shortage of materials, shortage of inputs uh, was uh, a very serious problem already at uh, that time. And as you can see, uh, the share of companies which name the shortage of inputs as their main problem uh, is actually very high. Uh, it's mostly in electronics, automotive, but not only. Plastics or furniture, for example, with higher prices of wood, with uh, difficult access to, to wood, uh, that affects um, furniture producers, not only in Germany, but also in Central and Eastern Europe, uh, in, in other regions. So 
as you can see, uh, actually here all those sectors mentioned here, they recorded, um, well, actually they reported um, the, the shortage of inputs as, as a very important, as a crucial program uh, in their activity. And going further in terms of trends that we have this year, um, these supply chain disruptions also caused um, um, uh, higher costs of transports and, and um, let's say, and not the same access to transports that uh, it was before the pandemic or, or even in, during the first uh, stage of the pandemic. So on one hand, uh, here those charts are, are just on the maritime transport because I think that's a very good example of, uh, of that what's happening uh, with these links between supply and chain disruptions and, and transports. So on one hand, we have uh, the container throughput index uh, that is really very high, that accelerated a lot uh, also, uh, the, the result uh, for that was when we had those first stages, first waves of pandemic, uh, conta containers left, for example, they, they left in China, uh, they didn't come back uh, to Europe, uh, and uh, the access to, to containers was much more difficult. On the other hand, uh, and also correlated with that, we have maritime rights. Uh, that uh, increased uh, very rapidly, especially in uh, last months, uh, even last weeks. They remain on high levels. Well, we can say that, of course, it's maritime uh, uh, transport, uh, that it does not relate to um, uh, the, the whole transport sector, but actually it applies to, the, uh, to a significant part of the economy, because uh, those uh, transports coming, for example, from China to Europe, from China to the US, they are done via maritime transport. So those costs actually affect uh, the overall economic uh, situation. And it's not only in the maritime, because if we have um, alternatives uh, in the form, for example, of airline transports uh, or railway transport, that also impacted uh, higher costs of, of those mentioned other forms of transports. Uh, well, so indeed, those are trends for 2021, which actually will not disappear uh, in a day, uh, in a week. Uh, we expect that um, co high commodity prices, I will then at the final part of our uh, presentation, uh, I will refer to our forecast for commodity prices. Uh, but nevertheless, I can say right now that we expect that they will stay at uh, elevated levels. Uh, also, uh, here this shortage of, of inputs uh, is um, either not going to disappear uh, in uh, just in a day, in, in few weeks. Um, we expect that, for example, the shortage of semiconductors will uh, even last uh, at the beginning of 2022. And so actually we have to be prepared that uh, those shortages uh, are staying uh, with us for, for the time being. And, well, that was on trends uh, that we have this year in 2021, but uh, let's also take a look on uh, some more global macro picture. So, uh, our latest GDP growth forecasts, um, well, uh, maybe starting from uh, this crisis year of 2020, uh, as you can see, the recession reached 3.5% in terms of uh, global development. Uh, well, it was of course uh, the higher disruption, the higher contraction that uh, we had uh, in uh, after the financial crisis or during the financial crisis, uh, so 2009. But somehow it was expected. Uh, we we have not tackled with the pandemic before, uh, at least to not there was after the Second World War there was not a, such a big factor of losing su such a uh, rapid and uh, deep uh, economic contraction. Uh, but what we have right now in 2021, our forecast assumes that uh, the economy will go up strongly by 5.6%. So at the first glance, it looks really impressive uh, because uh, this rate uh, is uh, much higher than it was before the crisis um, in all those previous years. But please be aware that it is strongly fueled by so-called statistical base effect. So we compare to very weak levels of 2020. That's one issue. Other issue is that uh, we uh, here in the um, this global GDP growth average, uh, it is uh, weighted by uh, the size of economies. So economies like uh, China or the US. 
uh, they have a really big share in uh, this global GDP growth forecast. And both of them are expected to record at quite high growth rates this year, like uh, our latest um, estimation for China is 7.5% growth this year, uh, for the US 6.5%, so they will also fuel this um, global average uh, very strongly. I think that more in 2022 20, we'll have uh, coming back to, to let's say, um, normal economic activity uh, with uh, growth 4.3%, nevertheless also uh, still um, uh, high in terms of previous levels, but as you know, still we have also in 2022 consequences of the pandemic uh, and maybe not the consequences of previous uh, previous developments, but uh, as you know, we, we cannot be sure what Delta variant or other mutations of COVID-19 uh, will cause uh, for particular economies and for the global economy as well. Um, this is what epi epidemiologists wants, uh, warn us uh, about, uh, that autumn months could be really harder in terms of uh, COVID-19 infections acceleration. Uh, so, so indeed, uh, this scenario should include also uh, the possible impact of um, the COVID-19, which uh, in our view, of course, uh, even if, if it happens, uh, will not be such harmful like the first wave of, of uh, COVID-19. We, uh, we, I mean economies, businesses, households, are more used to do business, to do activities uh, during the pandemic. So, so of course, uh, even if we have some regional lockdowns, the impact <clears throat> is not likely to be uh, such, such deep and such severe like it was uh, during the first wave uh, of uh, the COVID-19. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, I already said about China and the US that uh, they are expected to, to deliver high growth rates already uh, this year. And as you can see on the chart on the right hand side here, I put uh, G7 countries, so advanced economies, those, those biggest ones uh, worldwide, um, to check which one are already at pre-crisis levels. Uh, as you can see, we have the United States, uh, which is already there which reached back the same uh, nominal level of GDP that uh, it had in the last quarter of 2019. Unfortunately, other countries, uh, and that includes also very important destinations for us, um, export destinations like Germany and other Western European countries, they are still below pre-crisis levels. Uh, we have to wait uh, for, for the recovery. I, I will refer more to, uh, to those economies uh, in, in next slides. Uh, but as of now, uh, let's focus for a while uh, on uh, the United States economy, because as you can see, it recovered uh, faster. Uh, but uh, it's also, um, even if countries in Central and Eastern Europe are not very active exporters on, on this market, However, we can find some examples where, where the share of the US is much bigger than in terms of others. However, right now, uh, in those economies linked with each other, with wide supply chains, um, nets, uh, we, we, we should care also about such um, big economies like the US is and then to monitor also what's happening there. Uh, so, well, just uh, very briefly, uh, in terms of the US, they, they were faster than Europe in terms of the recovery process um, because of, um, I think there are like two very important reasons. One of them is related to COVID-19, uh, where uh, of course the US suffered a lot from COVID-19, it still uh, suffers, but um, lockdowns there were more regional in particular states that there was, uh, we, we cannot say that it was equivalent, the same equivalent of that what we uh, had in Europe. And the second issue, that contributed strongly to um, accelerated household consumption was uh, economic impact payments. On the chart on the left hand side, you can see that <clears throat> those uh, shaded areas with uh, yellow color, uh, there are those uh, points of time when we had uh, introduced, when, when we had payments of, of um, those particular uh, support for households. They were direct payments depending on that how big um, is the family, what's the income level and so on. Uh, however, uh, households they received let's say cash 
for spending and, and that helped a lot uh, in terms of uh, retail sales uh, increase. Uh, if you participated in our webinars in the past, uh, I, I showed also uh, when, when, when it started, I, I showed the difference between the chart with, with the difference between the retail sales in the US and Europe and still it still remains the gap between those two is still high. So in the US, those uh, direct payments um, help to increase household consumption, whereas of course in Europe we, we have had, we still have um, um, economic support, but uh, those measures were, were not as high and at least in terms of um, support for households, not in the same scale as it was in the US. Uh, well, so uh, all in all, as I said, that contributed to also to improve the economic activity. But what we have right now, uh, right now, uh, some of those measures expired. Uh, also, the, the, also President Biden and the Congress there uh, considers to to extend timing of some others, also to implement uh, maybe some other tools to to uh, support households and as a result economy. But nevertheless, consumer sentiment dropped in the U.S. And that's not only because of um, ex the expiration of those economic, of part of those economic impact payments, but also as a result of um, uh, that people are afraid uh, regarding other variants of COVID-19, including Delta variant, uh, that that could hurt not only them in terms of the health situation, but also in terms uh, of the labor market. Uh, finishing the picture of the US, uh, just uh, I think two important issues for uh, the remaining part of this year and especially for the next year. So one of them uh, is uh, so-called tapering, so that um, the US Fed, uh, so uh, the equivalent of central bank there, um, that uh, it will start the uh, monetary tightening policy. Um, which also affects actually uh, other countries because uh, that's the US dollar, that's the monetary policy in the US, so very important economy. Um, perhaps uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, we are not so linked, so much linked uh, with uh, the US dollar, um, more with, of course, with, with the euro, with actions done by the European Central Bank. But uh, of course, there are some exceptions, like for example, Russia, which is also in our central European region, that uh, economy is, is more linked uh, uh, to uh, the exchange rate of, of US dollar and then what's, what's happening uh, with the monetary policy uh, in the US. So uh, that's on the one hand side. On the other hand side, uh, we have the huge infrastructure investment plan, which will uh, contribute not only uh, positively to the construction sector, but to the overall economy. Uh, and actually that's one of the tools that we will see, we, we, we started to see and we will see also in other economies. Infrastructure, infrastructure spending uh, is, um, I think, very typical tool when governments want to increase the economic activity to support the economic activity. So that applies to the US with this uh, huge plan of investments, but not only also uh, to other countries. Uh, and before we will move to Europe, a few words on, on Asia, especially on China. <clears throat> so, as I said before, China was the economy that um, already um, that, that already experienced uh, or even benefited from uh, faster than other economies from, from uh, let's say, maybe not tackling the COVID-19, uh, but um, decreasing the infection rate and also um, introducing some easing measures with not uh, so, such strict lockdowns. But when we take a look at uh, Asian economies, um, not only in China, but also other ones, we see that um, unfortunately the momentum has, has been losing here. And that um, applies to such economies like Taiwan, Hong Kong, um, also other ones, they are above those 100 uh, level that you can see on the chart uh, on the left hand side. Um, but nevertheless, it's not such an acceleration even for other countries like China or Korea. It's not uh, such a high acceleration <clears throat> that uh, it was in the past. Of course, let's keep in mind that in China we have this uh, zero COVID-19 policy. Uh, and uh, well, it, it also started to uh, affect uh, us in Europe, uh, in the US, in, in other countries, because 
<clears throat> that uh, reminded us that the risk of supply chain disruption also could be caused uh, by, by this issue. As you can remember at the beginning of 2020, there were <clears throat> concerns regarding the supplies of uh, various intermediary goods and final goods uh, from China because they had lockdowns at that time. Uh, and right now, when they have zero COVID policy, it applies again uh, that they close, even if they have some few infections of COVID-19, they close some districts, some regions, and some factories cannot operate uh, on, on their regular level. So again, this impact of COVID-19, although we, we, are, we are living with the pandemic already for, for some time, still the, the impact of the pandemic and, and lockdowns uh, could be uh, indirect for, for other economies. And I think that's a very good example of that. And finishing <clears throat> with Asia, finishing with, with China, uh, as, um, as you perhaps as, as you heard, uh, and also as I said previously, this uh, losing momentum is caused by um, various factors. The consumption side, so the household consumption remains strong in China, but uh, nevertheless, um, it's not as um, solid, not accelerating so much as previously. Uh, people are not only afraid of uh, COVID-19, but uh, the support for the economy is lower. And um, I think we will not come back to the same levels of GDP growth that it was in the past. I mean, like uh, the Chinese economy grew by 10% uh, in, uh, in particular years. Still data for the first half of uh, 2021 were impressive, but they were mostly driven by the statistical base effect. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, uh, this what I mentioned with zero COVID policy that, that also um, is linked with, with port congestions that uh, somehow slowers weaker dynamics of, of exports uh, coming from China. And as a result, it also affects the economy there. <clears throat> so finally, Europe, starting with Western Europe. Uh, as I said previously, um, unfortunately in Europe, we do not have uh, the comeback to, to the levels uh, in terms of the nominal GDP that we had before the uh, pandemic. Um, that includes also very important economy for us and, and for the whole Eurozone, so Germany. Um, on the other hand, and you can see it on the chart on the right hand side, we have PMI indicators. Uh, so the survey that, that is done uh, among companies uh, here on the right hand side, you have that for manufacturing, which actually increased to very strong levels uh, when, when indeed uh, those, uh, this revival of global trade uh, was uh, supportive for exports. And that was also supportive for the manufacturing sector especially that the services sector at that time still suffered a lot uh, from, uh, from uh, various restrictions. Uh, so as you can see, uh, PMI levels uh, increased really to, to really high levels, uh, much higher than they were uh, before the pandemic. And uh, although uh, right now they are like going down, they, they still remain on higher levels than before the crisis. Uh, so still you can say that what is above this 50 line is considered to be uh, the recovery process. So still we are uh, on the recovery process. Uh, but well, here, of course, those supply chain disruptions, um, all those supply concerns affect strongly also PMI levels that they can, that they um, don't enable to stay uh, at, at flat levels, I mean, at, at those very high levels already recorded uh, previously, uh, thanks to improved economic activity. Uh, just for a while, um, looking not only at the macroeconomic side, but also microeconomic side, um, let's, let's take a look at some, some more uh, data here. Uh, so, as uh, you probably have heard, as, as you noticed also in your countries, uh, mostly insolvencies, uh, business insolvencies in 2020 decreased. Uh, of course, it could be treated as a surprise um, uh, why, at, with such a high extent, uh, such a wide crisis, uh, business insolvencies decreased, not sort like it uh, should be expected. But here, of course, um, the reply is, is quite simple that governments introduced really lots of supportive measures. In some countries, we have also moratoria on insolvencies. 
so that stopped this process uh, even if we have some countries that uh, where insolvency is slightly increased those measures uh, helped uh, well they, they just reduced uh, this impact uh, so as you can see on the chart on the left hand side those uh, navy bars for uh, biggest eurozone economies in all those countries we had a decrease of insolvencies but when uh, we uh, had like more detailed analysis when we did research we did calculations we implemented special model we see that uh, lots of um, uh, insolvencies that were already in 2019 um, well sorry another way that uh, lots of uh, cases didn't appear because of um, those measures introduced and we should expect uh, that at the some point of time those hidden insolvencies that you that you have here with orange bars as a part of uh, 2019 numbers they will be manifested afterwards uh, the question is that when and actually the answer to this question is not easy because uh, as you know uh, in uh, some economies in, in lots of economies we have uh, various support measures that terminated um, but this impact uh, still is there and it's not like uh, we expect the increase of insolvencies very rapid increases of insolvencies because of this factor uh, still on the other hand still governments are likely to to use various support uh, various measures uh, to to support uh, businesses businesses if uh, they are in troubles if there's another wave of uh, covid 19. Um, so all in all we should uh, expect coming back to pre-crisis insolvency, insolvency levels but uh, according to our view it will be uh, relatively glad gradual and, and it will be quite a slight process but this is one hand on the other hand um, uh, let's let's take a look at other issues related also with this microeconomics and on the right hand side you, you have the example of Germany with the expected claims uh, coming from corporate insolvencies so despite the lower number of insolvencies we've seen that uh, insolvencies applied to uh, quite important large companies and as you can see the latest data uh, with this uh, 26 billion euro of uh, expected claims uh, is uh, the 96 percent increase year over year so the last bar you have is just for the first half of 2021 whereas previous bars are for uh, whole years so as you can see um, it's a significant increase so even if we have a decrease uh, in the number of uh, insolvencies we uh, for example in germany we had um, quite serious uh, insolvencies that caused uh, high claims so that also caused uh, troubles of uh, counterparties of, of such uh, companies so so let's be aware that behind the insolvency numbers well actually we should look behind the insolvency numbers because Currently, it does not refer, uh, I think, correctly what's what's happening uh, on the business side. Um, we just issued last week uh, the Germany payment survey. So we, we do payment surveys uh, in a number of countries around the world. Uh, and uh, well, here the situation is the roughly similar like with insolvencies. So those support measures helped a lot uh, with decreasing average payment details, uh, the delays. Sorry. As you can see, uh, as an average, they decreased from uh, 36 days in 2020 to 28 days uh, in 2021. And uh, actually all sectors recorded the decrease of payment delays. Uh, but I think from uh, our payment survey, there's, there's also a very good, it comes a very good conclusion uh, in terms of uh, main concerns of companies that they have right now. Uh, so that's what you have on the chart on the right hand side. Well, it includes um, the, the question was that what was the main, what is the main risk for the export business uh, for your business in the future? So that's on the export business, but uh, as you perfectly know, uh, Germany is very export oriented economy. So I think we can also refer that uh, to, to the overall um, situation of, of German companies. And as you can see, COVID-19 remains a very important concern, even uh, also. Um, um, um concluding to, to that referring to that what i said before that this delta variant of other mutations in next months could, could be 
uh, um, really huge concern uh, for, for households, for economies, but it's not the most important right now. Uh, the, the importance or rather the risk that the companies see that decreased over last year. La uh, uh, right now, disruptions of the global production chains and rising commodity prices are much more important than uh, effects of COVID-19. Uh, and um, uh, well, I think that that's very valid also for, for other businesses in other countries uh, that, that indeed uh, the pandemic uh, remains important. It's still, we are still living in times of uh, the pandemic, but there are other issues that became much more important. So like uh, disruptions of supply chains and then higher commodity prices. Uh, and uh, well, <clears throat> talking about Europe, not only Western Europe, but Central and Eastern Europe, uh, indeed, uh, supply chains issues, uh, th th there's a very significant concern right now for, for companies uh, in, in many countries. Here, uh, you can see many, really many countries, but my point uh, was that to, to show you that uh, we have a very similar trend in all countries. Uh, there are different levels uh, depending on the country, but uh, the trend is similar. What is, uh, what data are on those, on those charts? When on the left-hand side, uh, well, basically, it comes from the survey that is done by a statistical office in particular countries, and they ask companies about factors that limit production. Uh, and on the left-hand side, you have uh, the factor of insu insufficient demand. They ask companies if insu insufficient demand is a factor limiting production. If there's a higher number of companies reporting uh, that factor, that means that, that indeed it's, it's very crucial. And as you can see, whatever country it is uh, in, in Europe, um, the insufficient demand, which of course is very important factor that could limit production because if there's no demand, it makes no sense to, to, to produce, to manufacture goods. Uh, but the peak of that was uh, during the first wave or two waves of, of the pandemic. At that time, companies were concerned uh, regarding uh, the demand. On the right hand side, you have um, the chart uh, with again the factor limiting production, but here the answer was the material shortage, so the input shortage. So this is what we have right, right now, supply chains disruptions are caused by um, the lack of uh, inputs, higher prices of, prices of inputs, and as you can see, uh, in recent quarters, uh, that increased a lot. It increased, especially in Germany, which we depend on. Uh, the second one that, uh, that is the, the biggest uh, concern uh, in Europe is the Czech Republic, with, with really high uh, input shortages reported as a factor limiting production. But as you can see, also other countries, lots of those countries, Austria, uh, sea countries, they suffer uh, and they report uh, from uh, input shortage. So, well, concluding those two very colorful with lots of lines charts, I think that we can say that whereas uh, at the beginning of the pandemic, that was the demand side issue, the concern of companies was on the demand side. Right now, the biggest concern and the biggest obstacle uh, is on the supply side. Uh, so, so as you can see, it moved, um, it moved a lot, uh, but as I said, the supply side concerns right now are very, uh, important factor that is limiting production uh, level. Uh, well, uh, continuing with, with Europe, um, here there's a chart very similar to that what I showed you before already in terms of the biggest advanced economies and Western European economies, so coming back to pre-pandemic levels. Uh, but here I just wanted to focus on latest data, so latest data are for the second quarter of 2021, and to check which economies uh, in Europe came back to pre-crisis levels, so the level that was uh, in the last quarter of 2019. And as you can see, uh, with those positive val values, those economies are not only back at pre-crisis levels or even above it. Uh, well, Ireland dominates this chart. Uh, it was out of the scale with the increase of more than 20%. But, uh, well, to, to tell you the truth, also in, in previous years, many years back, um, even government, the government in Ireland, um, uh, they, they also expressed that um, it should not be put too much attention to the GDP level because it's driven by, by the financial sector, 
uh, strongly uh, and ups and downs uh, here, are, here are possible, but nevertheless, Ireland uh, has a, is a number one economy in terms of the uh, recovery process to coming back uh, to, to pre-pandemic levels. But as you can see, in terms of other countries, we have uh, um, countries that are mostly that mostly come uh, from Central and Eastern Europe. So Estonia, Serbia, Lithuania, Romania, Poland, uh, Hungary, uh, Slovenia is very Slovenia is very very close to to the pre-crisis level uh, right now. Uh, well, uh, beside that, we have Western European economies, Nordic countries like uh, Denmark and Finland, plus Greece. So, as I said, as you can see, a bulk of countries here that uh, is back at pre-crisis uh, levels are C economies. So, referring to the title of our webinar today, uh, so the European economy is back on track. Well, that's right, but uh, that's right uh, actually in terms of mostly C countries, so our region. In terms of Western European countries, we will have to uh, wait uh, somehow more, as I said, the last quarter of this year, the beginning of 2022, if we do not have the uh, strong negative impact coming from mutations of COVID-19. Um, other issues, unexpected issues, then those countries uh, should be back uh, at uh, pre-crisis levels also, what of course will be also good information for us as, as they are uh, very important trading partners of, of CE countries. Uh, those countries which are the weakest in terms of the recovery process uh, are uh, countries like Spain, Malta, Portugal, Italy. So as you perfectly know, very tourism sector driven, driven by the services sector indeed, although summer months were uh, better here than, than previous periods. Uh, well, it uh, didn't help to compensate those negative effects that we had um, uh, since the start of the pandemic. So still those economies are, are the weakest ones. Plus here you can see one CE country, the Czech Republic, which um, on one hand uh, is uh, very strongly correlated with the German economy, with the automotive sector, with the overall the manufacturing sector. But as a reminder, the uh, Czech Republic um, also suffered a lot from the wave of the pandemic that we had uh, in late uh, 2020 and beginning of uh, this year uh, with a strict lockdown measures because at that time uh, the Czech Republic actually was the economy with the highest number of COVID-19 infections worldwide uh, in terms of uh, per one million population. So, so indeed those harmful measures uh, had to be implemented and uh, as you can see it uh, took a toll on the economy, it still takes a toll, so here this recovery process is, is somehow weaker. Uh, and indeed speaking about um, uh, the COVID-19 and the vaccination process, um, here on the left hand side chart you, you have um, uh, data on that how it comes with, with the share of population fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Uh, well, uh, we have countries that are uh, very close to the EU uh, average, European Union average. So those are like Czech Republic, Hungary, Lithuania, um, other like Poland, Slovenia, Slovakia, closely following that. And of course, Austria uh, is, uh, is also is like it's Western, is the Western European economy. So, so it follows also that what's um, in Western European countries. Uh, we have countries like Bulgaria, Romania, uh, somehow Russia that uh, is weaker with those um, uh, vaccination rates. Uh, and well, <clears throat> unfortunately, we, we can say that uh, mostly in, uh, in countries in our region, it's not that there's a weak access to uh, vaccines, but that uh, people who wanted to be vaccinated, they, they mostly are vaccinated and there's uh, some reluctance but uh, to, to, by, by others to, to be vaccinated. But unfortunately, we are still not at the level what is considered to be the herd immunity. So that's why uh, I told you about this uh, Delta variant of, or other possible mutations of COVID-19 that could somehow shake uh, the economic recovery because of the uh, health situation. And I think people <clears throat> are uh, relatively concerned about it. As you can see from the consumer confidence indicator on the right hand side, actually they uh, improved uh, since the first wave of the pandemic, but I think that uh, only Austria and Bulgaria, those are examples where 
we have uh, those cons consumer confidence indicators at higher levels that uh, at the beginning of 2020 in other countries we have still lower levels so um, uh, so well uh, for the household consumption i think uh, it's uh, quite uh, there's a quite good potential for strengthening uh, dynamics for for strengthening the acceleration of household consumption but the factor of COVID-19 and its possible impact could limit uh, that, uh, affecting unfortunately also the economy. But let's hope not. Uh, let's hope indeed that uh, those next months will, will be um, months of acceleration with uh, higher consumer demand uh, contributing uh, overall to growth. Um, but uh, uh, just staying with, uh, with some few components of uh, GDP growth of Central and Eastern European countries. Um, well, here we have, we have had, let's say, a very good uh, contribution coming from fixed asset investments. So on one hand, public investments, but on the other hand, we have also companies that started to invest which at the beginning of this year was a kind of surprise, um, especially that, as you remember, in the first quarter of 2021, we still had uh, the negative impact and lockdowns in, in some countries uh, coming from the COVID-19. Uh, but uh, this revival of global trade increased uh, exports that, uh, that also contributed to higher demand for the manufacturing sector. Well, that... Uh, um, forced or, or rather motivated companies to increase capacity utilization. As you can see, there are only two examples here on the chart on the right hand side. The capacity utilization in uh, C countries plus Austria, uh, it increased a lot uh, due to this higher demand uh, that was started to be perceived uh, since the middle of uh, 2020. And it was quite obvious that the next step will be higher investment. So it's very good that it came. You have the chart for investments on, on the left hand side, but those are quarter over quarter growth rates. So even if you see that in Poland um, for, for the um, last quarter, there was a decrease when you um, uh, calculate it, when you put it together with the strong increase that we had in the first quarter of 2021, still we are on a, on a positive side, the same uh, situation with, with the Slovenia, just, just the scale here uh, is different. So, so all in all, there's, there's a good room for investments. And moreover, uh, finally, when we have a positive impact and, the, um, um, and allocations coming from the so-called the EU recovery fund, uh, investments should also contribute even more strongly to GDP growth. And those, uh, those funds uh, will be, of course, very helpful for uh, C countries, not only C countries, but also European countries, but according to like GDP levels, C countries are, are going to, to receive a substantial um, part uh, of that. Uh, so hopefully all countries will be very efficient uh, in allocations and, and in spending uh, those money. Uh, well, uh, I already said about increasing exports that uh, those global demand demand that started to improve in China that helped um, uh, uh, many countries to, to benefit from that. And that also applies to Central and Eastern Europe. Here are those um, levels uh, that you see on the left-hand side chart uh, is for, again, quarter over quarter growth rates because it does not make sense to compare year over year rates uh, as a year ago, it was still contraction. But as you can see, uh, in the last quarter of 2020, we had a huge acceleration of exports in CE countries. Um, which mostly was continued in next months. Uh, so, so again, it's quarter over quarter change. So, uh, it was it was then uh, continued. Um, it's of course uh, not only the higher demand, but let's remember about uh, the competitiveness factor that we have in Central and Eastern Europe, not only in terms of labor costs, but also um, and the, the workforce that uh, is is educated. Uh, and it, it, it is also, we, we could refer that also to FDI inflows, so foreign direct investments, which again in, uh, at the beginning of 2021 uh, started to strongly improve uh, in uh, all countries uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, actually, uh, as you can see, Estonia is, I think, is an evident example. It was also um, able to attract FDI inflows also in previous years. 
but here we have a very good performance of uh, Balkan economies, Adriatic economies, which are non-EU members. Uh, and uh, if, if you had a chance uh, to take um, uh, a look at our publication that we uh, did some time ago, we um, we focused indeed, we, we, we mentioned that uh, Balkan countries are those one which could um, uh, we, which, which could benefit from the so-called new shoring process. So, uh, as companies were reluctant, various companies in in, uh, in supply chains were reluctant to be so dependent on Chinese intermediaries, Chinese uh, counterparties. They wanted to at least to put some part of supply chains uh, closer uh, to Europe, uh, which uh, of course. Uh, it has a geographical proximity to Western Europe, so to important supply chains. And I think the part of that chart explains that, that indeed it's not a significant process that already happened, but nevertheless, we can find some examples. And, and I think this chart with FDIs uh, also is contributed by this factor. Uh, I already said uh, about the household consumption side, that if we do not have this negative impact of COVID-19, uh, then um, we, we, we could have uh, like more accelerated household consumption and more clear, clear way to, to the recovery process. Uh, but, uh, well, well, here, at least in terms of the wage growth, um, perhaps it's not the same level that was before the crisis, but in, for a bulk of countries, we came back to a strong uh, wage growth that we had uh, before the pandemic in Central and Eastern Europe. As you can see, like for Hungary, the latest data are, are weaker, but on the other hand, uh, even during the first wave of pandemic, it was a huge increase of wage growth. So here again, this is the statistical base effect. Um, so, so, so indeed, uh, it looks so, but uh, on the other hand, uh, I would like to remind you what was before the pandemic, that those higher average wage growth um, levels were quite harmful for companies uh, with, with uh, higher higher labor costs that, that are still very attractive compared to Western European uh, levels, but nevertheless they are going up and up and it came back. And that's the same actually with labor shortages. On the chart on the right hand side, you have the example for Poland, but here the trend for, for other countries uh, is, is very similar. So uh, this is um, uh, those, some of those lines you, you've seen um, uh, previously. So this uh, green navy line is for insu insufficient demand. And uh, during the first stage of the pandemic, as you can see, insufficient demand became much more important factor that labor shortages, labor shortages in Central and Eastern Europe were somehow eased. But right now it's reversed. Labor shortages are again much more important factor than uh, insufficient demand and again this material shortage, input shortage is becoming more and more important as you can see the acceleration of the latter uh, is much faster even uh, than, than labor shortages but let's let's remember that I think that's for also for next year's labor shortages came back to the region and concluding negative uh, demographic proje projections they are going to, to, to stay with us. Uh, uh, almost uh, final uh, on on uh, on the presentation side. Um, all those what I mentioned. So higher costs of input, they of course impacted higher producer prices. Uh, as you can see, they increased a lot uh, in in all countries, um, and uh, they started actually also to affect the consumer inflation. Of course, consumer inflation was impacted by higher food prices, energy prices at the beginning of the year, actually the energy prices are still very important contributor to uh, higher inflation. Uh, but as you can see, it's still not um, the same uh, transfer of producer prices to consumer inflation. As you can see, the index, uh, the, uh, the chart on producer prices, the scale is up to 15, whereas consumer inflation, the scale is up to seven. Uh, so, so indeed, it seems that a uh, part of this increase, uh, at least so far, is taken by by companies um, um, also expanding that across the supply chain, not only for the final consumers, but it's not possible that it will last forever because companies will just not sacrifice their margins uh, with, with such high cost of producer prices. I already talked uh, about uh, inflation that uh, it increased and it made already some central banks to, to react. 
um, in Russia, that was the first central bank to, to, to increase interest rates in Central uh, European region. But uh, in the core CE, we have the Czech Republic and the Hungarian uh, central bank uh, that already increased interest rates. rates uh, the Hungarian central bank, I think we should also expect that we uh, could do the a similar move uh, also today uh, at, at the meeting. Uh, what about other central banks? Uh, well, um, for example, the Polish central bank is very reluctant to increase interest rates. Uh, it, it expresses view that uh, it's not driven so by internal factors. But uh, if we have this issue, what I said before, so not such high impact coming from um, uh, from from uh, another mutations of COVID-19, if we have accelerated household consumption, then we will have also uh, higher costs uh, typically coming from the demand side. And then I think other central banks could follow. Actually, I would expect that, for example, Polish central bank, the Romanian central bank will start increase three interest rates, if not late this year, then at the beginning uh, of, uh, of next year. Um, uh, and just a word on uh, the fiscal situation, as, as you perfectly know, uh, those stimulus measures, uh, massive uh, measures that were implemented to help economies, companies, households to, to, to soften the impact of uh, the pandemic, that cost a lot. And uh, budget deficits in uh, Central and Eastern European countries uh, widened a lot. Uh, they are especially high in um, non-EU countries, Balkan countries, um, uh, mostly, and, and I think with um, a lower proceeds from the tourism sector, it will be not so easy to come back to that. Uh, in other countries, I think we mostly see um, uh, uh, narrowing budget deficits, but the impact of COVID-19, uh, we will still uh, exists will still remain uh, in, in those accounts, let's say, uh, for even for next years. Uh, however, of course, not as high as it was in uh, 2020. And as I said, as a final word uh, from, from uh, the presentation side, uh, our forecast on commodity prices, we have the model with forecasting commodity prices of, of various commodities. Here you have uh, various examples, um, uh, not only typical commodities, uh, but also like agricultural price, prices. Um, well, as I said before, um, there was an increase of commodity prices and uh, we expect that they will uh, uh, remain on high levels. Uh, so they are not going to come back to, to those levels that we had uh, during the pandemic, but also before the pandemic. So, so indeed, uh, there will be still higher costs of inputs uh, for companies. Uh, just in, in case of a few agricultural prices like uh, sugar and soybeans, uh, we expect slight decrease, but only slight one. In terms of others, um, uh, we, we expect that uh, they will increase even more. The increase will be not such as high like we had uh, in, in previous weeks, but nevertheless, as I said, they will be at least at the same level that are right now or even uh, slightly higher. Okay, so, well, I, I was uh, longer than uh, expected and longer than I said, so sorry for that, but I, I wanted to update you with with our view uh, on, on various issues which are very important. Uh, so right now, uh, this time indeed for the Q&A session I mentioned before. Uh, as a reminder, uh, on the right hand side, uh, you have the questions window. Please type your questions uh, there, and then I will do my best to, to answer uh, it. So uh, let me just take a look if we have any questions so far. Just I will open that. As a reminder, also uh, we have um, uh, we, we you can download the presentation uh, already now. Uh, if you would like to do it, that's in the hands out section. Um, okay, I'm just looking. Okay, uh, we, we have uh, uh, the first question. As you mentioned several times on the links with China, what could be the indirect impact of a potential default of Evergreen Group for us in CEO wider in Europe? 
Uh, well, uh, in terms of evergreen, indeed, it seems to <clears throat> to, to, to be right now uh, an important issue that I think affected um, at least so far like uh, stock exchange markets, currency markets. Mm -hmm. Um, it uh, also put a kind of flow to, to so-called safe haven uh, harbors, uh, so so like Swiss franc, Japanese yen. Uh, yes, yeah, Evergrande. Sorry, sorry. Uh, also for, for me, that's Evergrande. Uh, thank you, Matej, for for correcting uh, for me. Uh, that, that's also uh, it's connected with, with the name of this transport company. Uh, so sorry for that. Indeed, it's Evergrande. Um, uh, so, um, well, here, um, I think, as I said, this impact we see for uh, stock exchanges from the currency, for the currency market. Uh, as I uh, exchanged views with our uh, Asian Pacific economists, uh, in his view, uh, is not the same that, for example, uh, we, we had with the uh, Lehman Brothers Bank. Of course, at that time, China was not as strong part of the economy as, as it was, it was caused by the strong part, so the, the situation of the banking sector in the US. Right now, China is much stronger, so, so we should um, uh, be more concerned about it. I think right now the question is that um, if it will also um, make an impact for other construction uh, sector uh, developers, construction, construction sector companies in China then uh, the problem would be significant. Uh, when we had um, uh, crucial problems of companies, of big companies in China, usually the government they reacted with some kind of support, various forms of support. Uh, I think we could expect something like this right now. Uh, but I think it's too early to say if we could be very clear on that, that really this impact will not be strong also for European economies because it could be. But for the time being, I think uh, it's mostly on um, some funds uh, that invested uh, not only directly in shares of Evergrande, but also uh, in terms of uh, they are holders of uh, their bonds because when you take a look at bond holders of Evergrande, they are very significant. I wouldn't like to mention here the names, um, but I think it's, it's quite official anyway. But but not to, to name that uh, some companies are uh, could be in a bad shape. But I think for some companies they hold that uh, maybe not a bulk part of those bonds, but nevertheless. Uh, when we conclude big uh, European and especially the US funds, uh, they could have some problems with, with uh, the default here. So let's wait for the impact. But uh, from my point of view, it's uh, the, the impact of that will be not uh, such a significant like uh, it started from the collapse of the Lehman Brothers Bank. <clears throat> okay, we have the uh, next question. What percentage of material shortage would you assume to come currently from speculation on different global raw material markets? Uh, thank you. That's a very good question. And actually, I, I forgot to, to, to refer to that uh, previously when I was speaking. Uh, indeed, uh, the, the speculation is an important part of that. It's not only that the demand of, um, of um, various commodities for various commodities is so high that uh, it explains such a high increase of prices. Uh, there's a significant part of speculation here. I, I, I'm, I'm not so brave to, uh, to give uh, any uh, percentage points. Uh, I think it will be difficult to estimate it. Uh, but I think that the conclusion for that uh, is that, um, well, it, at the some point of time, it could be a kind of bubble here that uh, when when the speculators uh, would like to be out with, uh, with with having profits from that, then we could have uh, the collapse of commodity prices. It's in our scenario, but let's say in, in not the most likely scenario. We still, as I said previously, and our models show that um, uh, we, we that prices of commodities are expected to stay at elevated levels. But if indeed we uh, somehow underestimated this uh, speculation part and at one point of time 
uh, let's say it's done, then it will also affect uh, the commodity market and we would have a, uh, as a result uh, the uh, strong drop of commodity prices here. Okay, uh, let me take a look if we have uh, any other questions. Uh, well, I think uh, no, I think there are not any other questions. So as a reminder, you, uh, you will receive the presentation and the video of this webinar afterwards. So, uh, you will be emailed with that. Of course, if you have any questions uh, afterwards, uh, do not uh, hesitate to ask, uh, do not hesitate to uh, contact um, uh, our account managers, uh, people that usually cooperate uh, from COFAS, and then they will send me and other economists questions if, if you have, as I said, any questions afterwards. Uh, just uh, as a final part of our webinar, um, well, I encourage you also to visit our LinkedIn account. Uh, we have publications uh, there that we upload uh, on a constant basis because we produce various publications or on various subjects. Uh, I just uh, mentioned during uh, this uh, our meeting um, that uh, we issued last week a Germany payment survey, so you can also download that um, going to our LinkedIn account. Then there's a direct link to our web page, or you can go directly to our uh, web page. A bulk of our publications is available for free, no matter if you are our client or not. Uh, so uh, I encourage you, if you are interested in some particular subject, to uh, download publications. And also, I hope that you find interesting uh, this webinar and that you will also join our uh, other webinars uh, in the future. So well, thanks for joining uh, us uh, this morning. As I said, I hope it was uh, interesting and useful for you and hopefully uh, see you next time. Uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye-bye.